All right, good morning. We are reading in Judges today, as we have been for quite a while. Um, reading chapter 16, verses 23 through 31, concluding the story of Samson. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we will read the scripture. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you hopelessly lost individuals, dependent on your grace, your mercy, daily dependent on the strength you give us just to make it through the day. God, we confess to you that we do not deserve your presence in our lives, but we thank you. We thank you for the grace you've shown us, the fact that you've called us to yourself, that you've given us your word as a light to our path, as a re revelation of who you are. We want to honor you. Please help to grow us as we study your scripture today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and read Judges 16, 23 through 31. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to rejoice. And they said, Our god has given Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their god. For they said, Our god has given our enemy into our hand the ravager of our country, who has killed many of us. And when their hearts were merry, they said, Call Samson, that he may entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he entertained them, and they made him stand between the pillars. And Samson said to the young man who held him by the hand, Let me feel the pillars on which the house rests, that I may lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women, and the lords of the Philistines were there, and on the roof there were about three thousand men and women who looked on while Samson entertained. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me, and please strengthen me only this once. O God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested, and he leaned his weight against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed with all his strength, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. Then his brothers and all his family came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtaol in the tomb of Manoah, his father. He had judged Israel twenty years. God's word to us today in the book of Judges. Let's observe. All right, we see that the Philistines have gathered together with all their leaders to sacrifice to their God. Excuse me. Believing that he, Dagon, had given Samson into their hand. As they celebrated, they called Samson out of prison to entertain them and um, placed him between the pillars of the house. Samson asks to be led to the pillars. He then prays to God to give him strength so that he might be avenged for his eyes. Samson pulls down the pillars and the house with it, killing many Philistines and himself. His brothers come and retrieve his body and bury it in the tomb of his father, Manoah. Quite an ending for Samson. Um, notable, memorable. Samson, in many ways, is a very, very memorable character in the book of Judges. And much has been made of him, his story. But what we see here, just as we have seen throughout his story, is that much should be made of God in these situations. And that God is the one who should get glory for this. So let's see um, how some of these details might be um, understood and, may, and perhaps applied to our lives. So we see that the Philistines, they're gathered to worship their God, this Dagon. Um, they're giving him glory uh, for victory over their enemy, Samson. And it would be 
I think, very hard for anyone who loves uh, the one true God, Yahweh, to read this without becoming a little angry that these people would be so presumptuous, <laughs> short-sighted, um, flippant, um, and also um, seeing any God other than the true God get praise is frustrating. How much more frustrating would it be for the Israelites to know that the Philistines are worshiping their God Dagon as though he is the one with the power here, or at least any of the Israelites who still uh, respected and honored the one true living God. Um, it, it is an affront to God himself that this lesser false God would be receiving glory here, yet he allows it. That's interesting, isn't it? That God not only is allowing this to happen, but he orchestrated events so that this would be happening. He removes Samson's strength at a key moment so that Samson would be um, held captive. Now we can, of course, uh, trace that back to Samson's disobedience as well, but all of this is in God's plan, and he allowed that. He has put Samson in a place and the Philistines in a place where everybody thinks that Dagon is powerful. One thing that's interesting is that um, this god Dagon, the only reason he was able to be viewed as powerful was because God removed his power from the situation. So that's very interesting. Um, if God had continued to strengthen Samson, no, would be, no one would have been praising Dagon here. So God removes his power, which in the absence of God's power, they, they're able to praise this lesser God as though he is powerful. So it had appeared as though the Philistines had, had won here, that, um, that their God was powerful. And the question might have been brought up if, if Israel's God was powerful, why would he have allowed their judge and champion to be captured and humiliated? It, it doesn't make sense, does it? I mean, defeat your enemies, then deal with your, you know, your wayward judge. Wouldn't that be the way most of the world would deal with this? Sure, we've got a leader who is corrupt. I mean, we see this all the time. We, we've got someone in charge of us who's corrupt. He's supposed to be leading, but he's not a good person. But we can't afford to discipline him now. We need to get through this, right? Hold it together because the fallout of losing our leader would be greater, far greater than, um, than disciplining him. I'm sorry, then, then allowing him in, in, to remain in power. And then we'll trust that later we can discipline him. But that's not the way God works here. He says, no, I'm concerned with Samson. I'm concerned with this false God. I can take care of all of it. We can trust God that, that he can hold many, many threads in his hand at once and weave a beautiful tapestry out of it. Even if... Up front, in our own wisdom, we don't see how that would be possible. And I think there are more of us who should accept discipline in our own lives and move forward in faith that God will restore us rather than trying to avoid it. And many Christians that should accept and pursue uh, accountability for their leaders and not just try to cover it up in fear that their church will be disgraced or God will be shamed or whatever. You don't need to cover up for God. He, he brings people low. He can work things out even from the jaws of seeming defeat. So um, that's pretty amazing. This is not the way I think anyone would have set this up. Right? I think we all would have said, Defeat the enemy, then deal with Samson. But God said, no, I'm going to deal with Samson and defeat the enemy. This is my plan. <laughs> um, it's amazing. 
and, and for the Philistines, based off of what they see, and even what the Israelites would have been seeing here, um, what they could see and understand looked like Dagon must be great and was winning. Because they don't understand God's complete control and his ability to work in multiple areas at the same time. And then the Philistines, are, they're celebrating in great ignorance and arrogance because they don't understand Yahweh. And they're doing this, celebrating right up to the end, never seeing it coming. I'm kind of reminded of a little bit of the uh, the uh, the man in Princess Bride, Vicini, right? This guy's supposed to be so smart, and he thinks he has beaten Wesley in this battle of the wits, and he's laughing and laughing, ha 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 ha, right up to the end when the poison takes effect and he falls over dead, right? In arrogance and ignorance, celebrating till the last minute when the house crashes down on him. Justice is served, and God is shown to be great. He's glorified, and he's glorified all the more because it is in the midst of this celebration of this false God that he says, now I'm going to show you who's in control. Now I'm going to reveal what power looks like. I waited until the midst of your victory celebration to show you that this victory is not yours. This is part of my plan. And so he takes out not only a bunch of Philistines, but he takes out all the lords of the Philistines, and he takes out their God all at once. Takes them all out. Because who after this would seriously think Dagon is worth worshiping? Maybe people still did worship him. People do lots of stupid things. But anyone seeing and hearing what happened here would know that Dagon is not the one who is in control. He is not powerful. It is God, the God of Israel. So God, in his wisdom, allowed all of this to come into place just as he wanted to take out the oppressors of Israel, um, the leaders of the oppressors of Israel, and the God of the oppressors of Israel. Whew, done. For Samson's part, I mean, it's not a good ending for Samson, is it? We see he dies blind, crushed with the enemies of Israel, even his final ask of God is a selfish one. God, please give me strength so that, what, so that I can bring you glory? No, that's not what he asks for. So that I can, um, so that I can avenge your name, so that I can um, defeat this God that is trying to take your, your worship? No, that's not what Samson is concerned with. He's concerned with avenging his eyes. It is interesting that it's his eyes that um, were gouged out, and it is his eyes that so often got him in trouble with, with women, right? Lusts of the eyes. Um, it is kind of interesting that Christ later says, if your eyes should cause you to stumble, it'd be better to lose them than to um, burn in hell, right? Um, I don't know if there's any connection, but it is an interesting um, slight parallel here. Samson loses his eyes, and he wants to avenge his eyes. It's a selfish request. God, please, oh God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes, right? Remember me and give me strength and strengthen me. I want to be avenged for my eyes. It's a selfish request, but God grants it. Um, and, and I think we have to at least give Samson this much credit, that he, in his time of need, did cry out to God. And he has on multiple occasions. Something, like I mentioned before, 
that the Israelites didn't even do in this, in this section of Judges, starting with their fall and their disobedience before the birth of Samson, they never cried out to God for a deliverer. But Samson does, and he has faith that God will strengthen him. And he has faith that it's going to work. I mean, he can't see what's going on. He doesn't know what the building looks like. He trusts that the pillars he's been led to are pillars that will actually matter. He's not an architect, and he can't see the building anyway. So in this cry to God, he's placing all of this in God's hands. Not just the strength to pull these pillars down, but the whole situation. You pull down the wrong pillar, it gets pulled down, nothing happens, everyone laughs. And then you're punished all the more for destroying something. He's placing this whole scenario in God's hands. Even in his selfishness, he has a great deal of faith in God. Imagine yourself there. You can't see anything. You don't know what's going on. You feel pillars, but you don't know what they are. You're, you're trusting that this servant has led you to the correct pillars, which is really trusting that God has led you to where you need to be. And then trusting that God is actually going to give you strength. He might have grabbed those. If, if, if God hadn't given him strength as he asked for, he would have grabbed those pillars and pulled with all his might. And they, everyone would look at him and go, what a fool. What's he trying to do? What's he trying to prove? This guy is pathetic. But again, Samson trusts the Lord that he's going to give him strength to do this. And God does. So here we do see Samson's faith, even though he is so, so immature and so selfish and short-sighted. But even that, God is using for his own glory. So it's at the height of the Philistines' worship of their false god that the Lord takes all of them out. It's at, it's at Samson's lowest and weakest that God uses him to bring Israel's enemies low and to, to glorify the name of the one and true God, the God of Israel. And God shows great mercy to Samson here. And he shows great mercy to Israel, who never even asked for a redeemer in this situation. Didn't even know to ask. And all of this reminds me a lot of Christ. Not that Christ was like Samson, but that the situation seemed hopeless. And the enemies of God were reveling thinking they had won. And it is that at that exact moment that God achieves his ultimate victory. Christ raises from the dead and all the celebrations in hell must have come crashing down on their head. The gates of hell could not withstand Christ and that structure the structure that Satan thought he had built and all of the work he thought he had done and the victory he thought he had won came crashing down on his head and he was shamed forever. Defeated completely. And we know this and we see this in scripture and yet we despair when we see things going wrong. We see the world and it looks like evil is winning. But we know better. We should know better. God is in control. He will not abandon his people. And he will not allow his name to be disgraced. If it looks like God's name is being drugged through the mud and that he's being shown to be weak, you know that he's setting things up for his ultimate glory. And it will be more glorious than we could have imagined, more glorious than what we would have planned. Have faith. Our God has already won, and he is a God that, that is in control and will glorify himself 
and and aid his people. So praise God for that. Things are not always as they might appear. Even when it seems evil is winning, God is in control. We can learn that from this passage, and we should remind ourselves of that every day. Let's pray. Sovereign God, thank you for your power, your might, your foresight, your ways which are beyond our understanding. Thank you that you that you protect us. Thank you that you have saved us. Thank you more so that you protect your own glory, that you glorify yourself and are never shamed. If we think we see your name being shamed, it's because we don't understand the circumstances and what is going to happen. Thank you that you are a patient God who works all things out for your good and and the good of those who, who believe in you who trust you. And thank you that you have um, the wisdom and intellect and power to use every situation for your glory. God, it ends up being so much greater than we could have planned ourselves or we could have even imagined when you defeat your enemies completely just as they thought They were victorious. So God, help us to rely on you and who you communicate yourself to be in your scripture. Help us to know that you are in control and trust that. We see your power and your heart on the cross and in the resurrection. Help us to trust the work done by Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. All right, everyone, have a wonderful day. I'll see you again.